Good morning and welcome. We are here again for another Good Code live stream. We are so happy to have you and thank you for joining if you're watching us on a recording. Thanks for being here. So what we're going to do first is go through a, uh, this is our ArcGIS, excuse me, one uh, ArcGIS Survey 123 live stream. We have a special guest, Chase with Esri, who's going to be here. Uh, before that, let's run through our Good Code Hackathon basics. So we have two ways to win. We have our Jane Goodall Institute Challenge, which is where you'll integrate geospatial field data collection and camera trap workflows for conserving chimpanzees and their habitats for the Jane Goodall Institute. This is where you want to pay special attention to this live stream. Um, Esri is going to help you out. Also, we have our Greater Good Challenge where you build an innovative web or mobile application that automates and connects agreement e and or e-signature processes for a nonprofit of your choice. The nonprofit organization must be a registered 501c3 or local equivalent to be eligible. So if you're outside of the US, it needs to be a local equivalent. 501c3 is a US uh, uh, registration. As well, a question that has been asked multiple times and I want to cover, uh, you do not have to have permission from your or from the uh, nonprofit in order to start working on this project. So you don't need to uh, wait there. You can go ahead and get started now. All right, let's also go through our prizes because that's really important. So our prizes, we have $50,000 total prizes to be awarded. Our first place prize is $15,000 for our Jane Goodall Institute Challenge. That is more than our Greater Good Challenge because we want you to focus on that one. That is our what we feel is the absolute most important because we are helping the Jane Goodall Institute, which is an absolutely amazing organization. Um, I also want to call out specifically our bonus prizes. So we have a bonus of Beyond DocuSign e-signature. And this is where you're going to, you go beyond DocuSign e-signature. If you did not win a first through third prize, you can win a bonus prize if it is the best use of DocuSign. As well, if you are a first through third winner, you can also get that bonus bump for another $5,000, which that's a lot, right? We also have a bonus prize for best use of Esri APIs and or ArcGIS Survey123. Uh, and that is another $1,250 of a nice little bonus. So again, pay close attention to this, to this live stream. All right, let's get into it. I would like to welcome today Chase Fisher. He's a solution engineer for local government at Esri. Thank you for being here today, Chase. Thanks for having me. We're so excited to have you and looking forward to your presentation. So I'm going to let you get straight to it. All right, Chase, here we go. Thanks. Appreciate it. Let me get my screen set up here. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm Chase Fisher, Solution Engineer with Local Government with Esri. Um, first off, I want to thank DocuSign and the Jane Goodall Institute for involving us in this Good Code Hackathon. Today, I'm going to introduce Survey123. We'll talk about JavaScript API and app linking using URL parameters. So hopefully you have some familiar with Survey123 and JavaScript, but if not, it's OK. We do have a lot of ground to cover. Um, but uh, I hope, you know, some of you may have seen my colleague, Jim Barry, gave a broad overview of our platform a few days ago. I believe you can still find that link to the video on the Slack channel. So um, like I said, we got a short amount of time and a lot to cover. So let's uh, go right ahead and, and drop in. So what is uh, Survey123? Survey123 is a location-aware form-based solution. It ties in with ArcGIS platform. It's supported on both desktop and laptop um, for collection directly from a browser and or field data collection with a mobile application. And that's available in iOS, Android, and or window. So Survey123 makes the best of form collection uh, and it makes the process more efficient. It allows you to provide rules and other smart form capabilities, which can drastically reduce the number of human errors as compared to, let's say, manually filling in a form. It enables you to offload calculations that a person may have needed to do on a piece of paper or with a calculator. Um, and it allows you to embed those calculations directly into the form itself, all while systematically allowing the user to submit their own data into a feature service. The feature service is an already existing table of data. So this eliminates the need to fill in a form with a pen or pencil and come back to the office and retype it into that database, um, which we all know is yet another point of human error whenever we're entering data. So data is entered one time, 
go straight into the user database. And it's an intuitive, fast way to automate form-based data collection. I'm going to go ahead and um, switch over to ArcGIS Online real quick and just give you a quick rundown of where Survey123 Web Designer is and some elements inside of it. So as you see here on the screen here, this is ArcGIS Online. This is just a configured a little different, but you can see the login and you can see the app launcher up here. Inside the app launcher, you'll find the Survey123 application. So when I click on Survey123, it's going to go ahead and bring up all the surveys I have. If I, in your case, you probably won't have any in here. Um, if you hit new survey, it's gonna give you the option for blank survey, a template or a connect. You're gonna go with a blank survey and just for time's sake, I wanna open a blank survey. And you can see it's, it's already in the interface and it's ready for you to start adding elements, whether it's a single line text where you can change the label, uh, default value. You can even run some calculations here if you'd like to. Um, you can set things to read only or hide from the survey from this interface. Um, you also have um, collaborate, analyze, and data tabs. So for the next tab, I'm going to go to one that's already been published. So you can see the collaborate tab. It's going to ask me if I want to save. I'm not going to save because I didn't change anything. But inside of here is where you can get the link to the URL. Um, you can open it in another browser. So that tab will open a new browser. This is where we can control how we share the survey, whether it's public or internal. Um, and then also look at the data and analyze the data um, as it comes in or actually change some of the settings. So if I was to open the survey in a new tab, this is what it's going to look like. The reason I'm showing you this is because this is where you can find that item, that item ID really quickly. So we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, but the app, the item ID right here is, is important whenever you're furthering into the JavaScript API. Also back here in ArcGIS Online, I'm gonna go into content. So once you publish one of those surveys um, in your content inside of ArcGIS Online, you'll get a folder produced. And I'm gonna look for a folder and you can see all these folders that I have that say survey and whatever it is. So we'll go up here and, and look for my um, survey, Clean City Pickup, I'm already selected on it. Inside of here, you see the form and then you see the core layer, and these are called view layers. These are where we could set different settings for sharing data that's not editable. But I wanted to show you the back backend uh, form layer. So this is the layer that's created when you create a form. And if you click on the data tab, it's gonna show you all the data that's selected. But furthermore, if you go into the fields tab, it's gonna show you the display name, which is not really relevant when we work with JavaScript, but the field name is. So it may display as address, but it's lowercase address. It may display as email address, but it's lowercase email underscore address. So this is where you're going to find your field names. So with that, I'm going to head back over to the presentation. So we have two ways to create forms in ArcGIS. The web designer, which I just showed you, and our desktop, app desktop application called Survey123 Connect. Um, we're going to focus on the web designer because we're going over web forms and how to use the JavaScript web app API. So creating a form is simple. Like I showed you in the web designer in ArcGIS Online, it's a drag and drop process. It's really simple to publish forms, no login necessary, or to share it inside your organization. And we'll talk about that a little further on when we talk about requiring a login inside of a JavaScript API uh, for non-public forms. One example you see here on the screen, you see a tweet from Stillwater SEMA where they published a survey one, two, three for damage assessment. On the far right, you can see what we support out of the box, supporting, making it easy for a user to publish a form and then embed it in a website. So without any um, coding, we can toggle styling options. We can show the header, the description, the footer, the theme. Um, and like I said, it's just an out of the box, no code. Well, it's actually code, but it's generated for you in a copy and paste interface. So why do we extend Survey123? So we do see people that have a need to want to extend Survey123 every now and then, further than what we provide out of the box. So here's a few cases. Providing additional custom-based business logic for example integrations um, with other apps, like currently with what you're doing with the hackathon. We also see the need to automate processes or better blend corporate identity, logos, um, and make the form look more native to a site. 
and or just changing the existing functionality. So what ways do we address these um, to extend? Well, to address serve as many different ways we can extend a capability, whether it's custom styling through themes, embedding into an application, or providing JavaScript functions to support custom business logics. And when we talk about this, embedding into a custom web app is at the heart of the JavaScript API. Python is also a powerful way to automate parts of Survey123. So if you're a Python programmer, there are ways that you can use Python as well as custom JavaScript functions to create custom business logic. But let's focus in and, and, and dive into the web app JavaScript API. So as I mentioned, the Survey123 web app JavaScript API allows us to embed a survey web app inside of an application that you author. By taking your application and integrating the survey form with the application, you can configure logic that your application uses to drive the life cycle of that form. So some use cases are definitely, like I said, applying custom CSS styling to further enhance or modify the look and feel of the form beyond what we provide out of the box. Being able to interact with the data um, as a user enters into the form um, with your application and having your application data um, add data, the application itself add data into the form, as well as being able to have your application respond to various events during a form's life cycle, like the on form loaded. This is a, the creation of the form and the life cycle of the form. On value change is interacting with the form when a value changes and on form submitted is just upon submission, what do we do? So these are some of the um, events that we can we can work with. So to give you an idea of how this actually works in an environment, I'm gonna show you another ArcGIS application, ArcGIS Experience Builder. And in here, I'm gonna show you how we've integrated Survey123 using the web app JavaScript API. So this is a fairly simple experience builder. On the left, you have a map of San Diego and some uh, parking meters. And on the right, you have a form. So the form comes in as no data um, and it shows the same map that you see in the map question. But the interaction between the two elements um, allows us to work with the form. So in this element, I'm gonna select on a uh, um, parking meter and this parking meter is then going to, the selection is gonna pass the information over to the form. So in the form, we're looking at, you know, the zone the neighborhood. Um, we can see that they match on the pop-up. We can also see the uh, meter location. Uh, we can see on the map it has selected and identified the same location as the current meter. We're pulling in things like pole ID um, and meter configuration. But then we have some variables for the user to enter in. Let's say the user wants to go ahead and do an inspection here. This is configured to say, okay, Tell me what you see um, in the field. We see that the meter's in uh, fair condition. And does the meter have any issues? Let's say the payment receptacle's jammed. And then we're gonna put in the notes, uh, chewing gum in coin slot, which would be a pain if you were the one that had to fix this meter. However, it being a pain, it does not implicate that we need to replace the meter. So we'll go ahead and hit no. You can see the inspection date is auto calculated. We could add a photo if we wanted to and then hit submit. Upon form submission, you see that we get a notification saying your data was sent successfully and the form reloads so that you can go ahead and continue um, inspecting any other element that you want. And so when you click on an element in the map, you can see that the data in the form is automatically updated. The data is never sent anywhere until you hit submit, but even just doing this, you can see how quickly it can pass information through um, from the map to the survey. So let's look at a little bit of the back end of Experience Builder so you can see these elements a little further and you can see how the JavaScript was put into a UI where we can, where we can react with it inside of Experience Builder. 
So in here, you have your real estate, you have your desktop, and you have two elements. On the left is a map, on the right is the uh, survey, and if you look into the content here on the outline, you can see map one, survey one. That's all we have in here. So we have actions set from the map element to the survey element, and these are all inside of these widgets that are pre-configured. When I click on the survey one, two, three widget, we get two, element, two items that we can affect with content and style. So you can see the content, we've already got the, the survey selected, and then you can edit some things in the appearance. Um, if we wanted to toggle off the theme, we could toggle it off and then the yellowish background goes away and we have a more neutral neutral background. You also have options to add a header, a description, a footer, or even just the options bar. And the options bar is basically a bar at the top that allows the user to log in or log out. And I got to move this. There we go. And so you can see where the options bar is. Um, and also, we have this send data to survey. So this is configuring the JavaScript on the back end to send data from the map to the survey. So we select what map, and then we select what layer inside of the map. And then it's as simple as just adding the connections. So adding the connections, we have, um, we picked a field that's in the layer. So in this case, the first one up top, parking zone, it's zone inside of the layer. And if you need to check that out, you can go back, look in the data, or look in the actual app and the pop-up. But basically all we're doing is mapping the location. So it's going from zone in the layer to parking zone in the survey. In here, we're going from area in the layer to uh, neighborhood in the survey, you know, so on and so forth. This is just how we map out what we're gonna populate from the application and how we can interact with it. And one thing that's really interesting in, in this and in the JavaScript is we can use shape point. So shape point is a field in the, in the layer that contains the geometry. We can pass that through to the map question, which is asking where is this location or what is the geometry? So we can also pass through not only information or text, we can also pass through geometry and location. So that's just a quick overview of like how we can, how the JavaScript has been already implemented into software that Esri already has. And now we'll go a little deeper into how you can implement it into your own applications and your own workflows. So we just saw, like I said, the existing application in ArcGIS Experience Builder and how it's using the JavaScript API to link a map with a survey. In order to get started with your own application that integrates a survey one, two, three, there's a few basic requirements. First, of course, you have to have a survey one, two, three form. If you're getting started, you don't necessarily have to have a completed form, but you have to have one started so that we have the item ID and we have a placeholder so that we can start directing the application to interact um, with the different elements. Um, as you start building your application though and configuring your application integration, it's best to get closer as close as you possibly can get to production with your survey. When you do that, you will have all the elements that you need in terms of creating the integration. So you'll have the fields, you'll have the field names, you'll know the questions, um, and you know how we want to pass information from the from your application to the form, and also monitor when a value changes, so on and so forth. Secondly, it needs to be registered. So that is, it needs to be registered with ArcGIS Online, or ArcGIS Enterprise. In your guys' case, you're using ArcGIS Online for the hackathon, so ArcGIS Enterprise is just another um, portal, and we actually call it ArcGIS Enterprise Portal, and it's an on-premise um, configuration of ArcGIS Online um, with a few more added capabilities. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. It just needs to be registered with ArcGIS Online, and registering the application with ArcGIS organization will give you a much needed client ID. Um, so hopefully you've done some development with our with our JavaScript before, and it's not a new concept, but it's pretty much just that the application needs to interact with ArcGIS platform, and it needs to be able to tell you what client ID you want to work with. So authorize your application when the user log in. And then lastly, uh, you just need to embed it in your web page. So uh, for this, we use script tag to reference the JavaScript API and elements in the web application to display the form. Um, 
normally a div HTML element. And finally, a drop script will actually initialize uh, the form by creating what we call the survey123 web form object. Just taking a look at Hello World equivalent for this, you can see that this HTML um, we have here in the script is loading the API from the Survey123 web website. In the head section of the HTML page, um, and then in the body, you can see where we have a div that will serve as the container for the web form. And then the script, um, that's because it's in the body, it will basically run on load and the page load that um, initiates that survey one, two, three form uses the client ID and it sets the container to which the web form uh, and also sets the web form ID. So hopefully this makes sense. It's just a quick breakdown of how we set it up in the head, the body and actually script to actually um, initiate the web design. So let's take a look inside of an actual live and running website. So here we're going to be using CodePen, and there's going to be several examples using CodePen, and we have we'll have the links for you. Um, we actually have all the links to the documentation um, in the Slack channel. I know this is a lot, um, and it's coming at you really rapid. So it, I say we only retain thirty percent of what we see the first time. So I, I understand that. So we'll try to get you as much information as possible afterwards. But in this presentation, um, what you can see is I pretty much have a, what a standard survey one, two, three form looks like when you give a URL um, or when you give a link to it. So it's a full screen. You can scroll up and down on it. Um, but I just wanted to go over the elements here. So this is actually being embedded. It's not just the link. So um, as you can see in the HTML over on the left, we have um, a div and we ID it as a form div. And then we have form div in the CSS with specific parameters for styling. So right now it's at 100% width. Um, it can be changed to whatever you want. Um, you, As you change, it should change. Change to 800 pixels. It's pretty much the same thing, but you see where we can change the style. Over in the JavaScript, um, you can see where we have the actual uh, initialization of a client ID from a web form. So if we go over to ArcGIS developer dashboard, you can see where these IDs reside. So you can see I have a code pen demo of the JavaScript API and it has the client ID and client secret grayed out. If we were to uh, click on the client ID, um, we can see that here's where I got the client ID which is another place to get it um, other than what I showed you online. And then here's a way to check on the back end if you edit it, um, what the redirect URLs are, the short and long URLs that can redirect to the uh, codepen.io. So as you see, everything is, is pretty simple and straightforward when it comes to using CodePen, checking out the HTML, the CCS, and the JavaScript and how it works together. So um, as we saw there, um, there are three required properties that we need to initiate a Survey123 web form object. The client ID, um, the container, and the item ID. These are all presented as an object. And if you refer to the documentation, we'll refer to them as options, even though they are what I would call required options. Um, if you will. We also have many additional options that you can initiate um, in a, with a web form. I've broken them up here. Um, and like I said, you don't have to scramble to write these down. I'd refer back to the, the video, hit pause, look at them or look at them in the documentation. But um, the first is, is data handling. So if you're using ArcGIS Enterprise, which you, you're not, you're going to need that portal URL. Um, this is just specify, specifications for an instance um, using a portal um, that identifies where it's coming from, basically. Another of the two parameters is mode and global ID. These two parameters go together because they allow us to set what your form is doing. 
By default, a web form will create a new record when we submit, but we can actually change the mode parameter and we can change that to have it view, edit, or copy data into an existing record. In order to know which record we're viewing, editing, or copying, we have to specify the global ID as well. So using the global ID parameter is gonna specify that actual record. So if you're using the mode parameter, you also have to use the global ID parameter. Um, that allows you to say, what am I doing to what object? So hopefully that makes sense. We have the ability to override default questions. So default questions values um, through a default question um, call, we can, um, we can override those. We also can initialize a form to not submit data to a feature service. So we've seen several instances where an author wants to put a form more or less into the, like a, a application as like a scratch pad or an in-app calculator, if you will. So by setting is disabled submits to feature service, which is a tongue, tongue twister there, the user is able to interact with the form and just have it be a regular form, but when they press submit, the data doesn't get stored in ArcGIS online. So again, this is useful in a form, in an application where you don't need to submit the data. Um, and then finally, you can pass the token from your application to a web form, and we'll talk about that later. This is required, tokens are required when your form's not shared publicly. And we'll talk about the security at the very end of why that's important to, to understand how to pass their token if your survey is not going to be uh, publicly enabled. We also have two parameters that help with um, help work with the display of the forms. The first is the hide element. So we can specify particular elements in the form to hide. This works very similar to hide URL parameter. We can also include form navigation components such as the navigation bar, the header, the footer, um, also the theme. So we saw an experience builder when we toggled off the theme, that yellow background disappeared. These are things we can we can put in there and hide as well. Uh, we can also set the width internally by providing value in pixels. Uh, we can register some event handlers uh, at the form load. We can also register these event handlers after the form is loaded, basically um, as a set function. So for each of these events, um, we can also begin uh, a web form with these already attached. You don't have to have them post post opening. They can actually happen as attached uh, before the load before the load. So we can act on those various actions and allow this allows us basically to capture most of the life cycle um, of a person interacting with the form. So with that, let's take a look at a bit of these options a little bit more complicated inside of a code pen. So this is a second code pen. And however, at this point, it looks very much like the first one that we did. As you can see, the form takes up the entire app. Um, it's not much different, but with this one, we want to do a few more different things. So the first thing I want to do is I want to pass a value into the form. So I'm going to set this to update the, the store ID here. So the store ID, in this case, we update the ID with a, a set value. This will go directly into the JS. So you should be able to see, you know, how a set value could be incorporated into the JS and also how you could substitute in the code variable substitutions. So with this, we'll go up here. Um, and then after the client ID, we'll put in default question value. It's asking for what field, and you can see it's store underscore I or ID, and then we set it as ten. It refreshes; it's ten. Whatever you put in this, it's going to automatically run that, reload it. So if we put it up to hundred, it's going to go up to hundred, um, and it's going to change automatically as well. So very often though, if you set in a default value for something, you don't want the person to be able to alter that field or change it. So the next thing we're gonna do is hide those elements. So um, let's first, uh, we'll make a space after the store ID and we'll start in hide. Hiding elements, let's, we can, like I said, we can hide multiple things. We can hide the theme, we can hide 
um, the nav bar, we can also, we definitely want to hide the nav bar because if you don't, they could accidentally log out and that would be a pain. So in here, this is where we can check off all the things that we want to hide. So let's go theme, um, nav bar. And as you can see, as soon as you hide those things, they disappear. And then also we're going to do the store ID. And so the syntax for that is field colon name of the field. And that's how we're going to hide that store ID. So now you can see that store ID is gone. All you can see is the title store count. Um, but the information is still in there um, and it's on the back end. So one final mod we're going to do here is to provide some function upon form load. So we're going to start with a on form loaded parameter and we'll see that that on form loaded is activating a window alert and it's just saying hello form. So upon reload, you see we got a pop up window and we got a hello form. That's just to show, you know, what we can do upon load. But let's expand upon that a little bit and we'll ask a little bit more functions. So this function um, that we're going to paste in here, it's going to be a little bigger. But this function is pertinent to how we're going to make the app interact. So if we, do, we delete this, welcome, give it a little bit of space here. Um, I'll copy this. It's going to reload. The data doesn't have a window right now, but we'll get a little bit of space here in the JavaScript window and paste this in. So what's happening now on form loaded is we're asking for the geolocation from the browser. So once we get the geolocation from the browser, then we're going to set geopoint with the coordinates from the browser. So this is giving a location to the store count based on where it's being submitted from. And all the user has to do on their end is allow it. Once it's allowed, that information is written into the form and ready to be submitted. So that was creating a set of default options um, at fire when a form loads to set values to a question, to alter the display of the form and to have the function fire upon loading and then provides a response um, to that function in the form. So uh, basically with that, we just want to make sure that you understand that it doesn't have to be just at load. We can actually set functions at load. So um, we got the geometry from the browser. Um, we've got that set question value. Um, those are things. So basically there's a few different things, right? Okay, so set question value. Set question value is a non-math question set geometry or set geo point. Those are your various math questions. Um, set value um, can take an object's value. You can also provide multiple question values at the time of interaction. The set geometry can take geometry objects in a variety of formats, whether it be Esri Geometry JSON, uh, GeoJSON, or XLS format. We also have set geopoint as a helper value for just the X and Y like we used in, in that uh, last demo. We can also set style so we can provide a series of CSS directives to further customize the styling of the form. Uh, we can also alter the mode of the form. So we can go from creating a record to viewing a record to editing a record simply by toggling the set mode function to switch out of whatever type of mode we're working with. And then finally, we can actually replace the form that we're viewing with the set item ID function there at the bottom. So this allows you to, let's say your application's overall workflow flow would benefit from having multiple different forms at different points or times during the life cycle of your application. You can easily use the Esri Survey123 container to um, set item ID and display different forms at different points and times during that life cycle. So let's take a look a little bit more into the app interaction. So this page is a little bit more complicated. Basically, we have a div to the right and to the left, and they're basically just serving as big buttons. 
you can see that the div uh, basically has an on-click event to adjust count by negative one. Or if you go down to the increment one, it's a div class to set increment by plus one. We also have a button in the middle. And this button is to open the form. So instead of having the form open upon load, we can actually set a button to load the form. And so this just shows you how it triggers right upon load in the old in the other pin. And if we go back, um, you can see how we can set the open form um, as a function in the JavaScript. And so upon um, clicking of the button, what we're going to do is we're going to call the survey one, two, three form. It's actually going to hide the button first, then call the survey one, two, three. And you can see all the client ID and all the hide elements and things that we've set before um, are all still in there. So in this case, like I said, clicking the button, the first thing you see is a button removed and then the form loaded. And now you can see the web, the web form statement showing, you know, all these functions, and then we can interact with it. Down on the person count, we can see that um, inside of the uh, HTML, you know, that plus one and negative one, that's going to adjust the count. We also see that we have... Um, set up some sanity checks here so that the function can't ever go below zero. So if count is less than zero, it equals zero. So these are just some ways to control it, to not get it in the negative. And then basically as we interact, every time I click, the count goes up. And if we go over to the negative, every time I click, it will go back down. And once it gets to zero, you see it highlight and basically just says, hey, can't, I can't go past zero. And so what we're doing here is just basically an interaction between a web application, between HTML and the form passing values into an application or a form. So um, also I wanna highlight one other application. So this is an application that a colleague, John Grayson at the Geo Experience Center at Esri wrote as part of the initial demonstration for JavaScript API. It's gonna do a couple things. It's going to run a speed test. Once that speed test is completed, you see it's going to ask for my location. If I allow the location, um, it's going to pass through the location. And then it's also going to enter in the internet speed that I have. So this is a quick internet speed survey. This is your speed. Are you satisfied at your location? Um, map question is auto-populated, enter your email and submit. So it's pretty simple, but it's, it's basically shows you kind of the power inside of this. So this is the GitHub where the actual app um, code is loaded. I'm going to open the main JSON here and kind of go through some of the directives in here. So you can see that initialize survey function, um, we're going to do the test, speed test. We are going to, once we get the speed test, we're going to get that information. Um, and then we're going to um, disable it after you've got the information so you can't push it twice. And then upon form load of the survey, we're going to pass the set value question of the speed, and we're gonna ask for geolocation. And then we're gonna set that location in the X and Y coordinates. So set value, set geo point, those are all the things that we went over. And you can just see how he put them in here to um, position the X and Y coordinates and to also update the, the speed. So we've seen a number of different ways that we can use the JavaScript API to embed um, a form and then to customize how that form interacts and looks in your own web application. I wanna provide a few considerations as you go about developing with the JavaScript API. First is that this works with public surveys by default. I mentioned that we touched back on this subject. Um, one of the optional parameters is 
the option to pass through, um, pass in with a survey one, two, three form is a token. So this is where you would be needing the JavaScript API to read a token to authenticate somebody who needs to log in. It's not a, it's not a uh, open um, survey. But the JavaScript API is embedding the form inside of an iframe. And that is a security worst practice. Uh, matter of fact, some browsers will just block it as a security no-go. So in order to have a private survey, you'll want to integrate your application so that you will have your application log the server in or log the user in and then pass that token to Survey123, not do it in the Survey123 embed. So as it happens, your, your app's already registered with the application. If it's not shared publicly, you're gonna to need to work this into your application to log them in and then pass that token into the Survey123 so that everything can authenticate and allow the, the, the user to log in. Um, so other thing that I wanna mention is that the on form submitted event. If you're using that and the user clicks the submit button, depending on the survey that they're using, it can become a fairly complex process. So it's important to know your data because if the form submitted creates what we call um, a feature set object, this is because the form may be consistent of multiple discrete records that get written into the feature service. We call this a repeat. And if this in this case, if we have repeats, the form has to repeat a section. And as if it has two repeats, then we're actually submitting three records, one record for the parent portion and one for each of those repeats. So it's very imperative to know your data structure. I don't think much, much people will probably run into this. I think there'll be simple forms, but just know that there are some caveats whenever there's repeats involved. Um, and just be aware that you know your data before you start developing your application. Um, there are a lot of benefits in the web API. We can really closely tailor the application to work against specific data structures. So um, you should have full capability over that. Last but not least, I know we're running over a little bit here. I'm going to run into um, Survey123 app linking. And like I said, don't try to scribble these down. I'd refer back to the video or look in the documentation. There's a lot in here. So what does the deep app linking and app integration do? Well, it's it's a well-known protocol for other apps to communicate with Survey123 through URLs. So there is a Survey123 link versus custom URL screen, and that's where the links only work in Android and iOS, where it's actually affecting the Survey123 app. Custom URL screen, a URL schema, that works with ArcGIS Survey123 um, across any browser. So um, it's good to know which one you're trying to affect before you start enabling these, and it depends on your workflow. So the URL schema in Survey123 allows you to launch a survey app, open a survey, pre-populate survey answers. Um, we're looking at expanded functionality into what we call the inbox inside of the app. Um, but if you're just working with the web uh, browser, that's not going to be relevant in this situation. So as you're developing your workflow, you can link specific surveys from any distribution point in your workflow, such as a web page or an email, any link. Um, your URL schema opens the um, possibility for opening a survey from a single layer, accessing through multiple layers. And say you have multiple layers in a field map, you can customize pop-ups in those layers to open different surveys based on that layer. So a lot of people have used that in the past um, to link between a field map and a survey um, through the attributes. Or you can actually even use arcade expressions um, to open surveys based on attribute layers. So let's break down the schema. Um, the first part invol invokes the Survey123 mobile app. So this is you know custom field app URL schema. So it's invoking the Survey123 mobile app for it to work. Survey123 app has to be installed on the device. So anything after that final slash is optional parameters. And you can pass um, anything you want into the app after that, after that slash. So the first thing um, is to start your listing parameters using a quotation mark. Or not quotation, a question mark, sorry. 
So using the ID parameter, you're telling the link, just like in the JavaScript, oh, let me go back. You're telling the, the, the uh, you're telling the application, just like in the uh, JavaScript, I need to find this item ID. What server am I opening? And then each parameter is separated by the ampersand sign. So parameters are made up of two parts. It's usually the parameter name and the value. And then those are separated by equal signs. So for example, the field street address. So it's field colon street address. It's 380 New York street. So what we're doing is we're telling the URL that open the survey and in the street address field, the survey needs to have the value of 380 New York street. Um, do note that the field names are case sensitive. So going back and understanding what the name is, not what it's displayed as, it's gonna be important to actually write to the right thing. It may say email address, but the actual name is email underscore address. So go back into the survey one, two, three, and make sure you know the schema and you know which field you're actually writing to. Last parameter is based on example of the um, center. So, so what this will do will set the location of the geo point question in the survey provided a coordinate pair. When you're doing a coordinate pair with the center option, it's got to be Latin long pair in decimal degrees separated by commas. No other coordinate system formats are supported. And as a note, just like in the survey one, two, three filled out the URL schema uh, web platform supports the use of these URL parameters. So although while similar, the Survey123 field app URL schema and web form URL parameters are two different things. So custom URL schema applies to the Survey123 field app and URL parameters only apply to web forms. Also noted that it's recommended to encode your URL if you can to avoid issues with spaces or special characters in the URL. So here's a list of custom URL parameters. These are more congruent with um, what we saw in the JavaScript. So, you know, center, set the point geometry, field, populate the field, ID, item ID, um, update, callback, folder. Those are probably not as necessary in these situations, but you can see here what each one of them would do in a URL parameter. And so these custom URL schemas, same thing. It's survey123.rgis.com item ID that opens the web app. Many parameters are the same center field portal. These are all going to help you use a URL to open a form pre-populate um, data. Mode. So we've, we talked about mode. We talked about hide, uh, recalculate token. If you're looking to pass through um, auto refresh, with if you're wanting to control it right there in the app um, and not in the CSS. But these are just basically how we use those URL parameters. And these are the resources. So there's a lot of resources and we'll have them posted in the Slack channel. Um, I know that was a fire hose worth of information. It was a um, condense, was condensing almost three hours worth of, worth of information. There are, um, videos, there's blogs, all going in and diving into each one of these things. So I hope what I showed you today helps and helps you dive in and start start creating this resource documentation, the resource center, the YouTube channel, the blogs, that'll all be in the, the Slack channel as well. And if you have any questions, you know, um, you can write them in the chat now or hit me up on the Slack channel. I'd be glad to help you help you with those. But uh, I want to thank you guys for watching this presentation. Thanks again to DocuSign and the Jane Goodall Institute for having us and good luck and happy coding. I guess if we have any time left, I know I probably went over, um, we can probably answer a few questions. That's okay. This was great. Thank you, Chase. So much information. Um, we have provided a lot of links in the chat. So grab your links there as well. These are, um, a lot of the links that um, Chase has been providing throughout. So thank you again for that as well. Um, if you do have any questions, please post them now. It looks like we've got all of our questions answered within chat so far. 
and with all of our links that we've provided. So last chance for questions. All right. So if we don't have any specific questions for Chase, um, I'm going to go through a couple reminders for our group. And we're going to say thank you to Chase for being here. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Like I said, if you have any questions, just reach out in Slack. I'd love to support you as you, you go through this hackathon. Great. And that is a great segue into um, Chase is going to be on the Slack channel. He is in our Esri tech help area of uh, channel of Slack. All right. Thanks again, Chase. Thank you, guys. All right, and as I said, we're gonna go through just some uh, quick hits on our resources that are available. And I'm gonna call out a couple events that we've got coming up. So we have all of our links he um, here shown. This uh, will be provided in our Slack channel and you will also be available um, on our YouTube, the DocuSign Developer YouTube channel. We do have a playlist specifically dedicated to Good Code Hackathon. Want to call out tomorrow, uh, excuse me, on the 26th. So, Tuesday, the 26th, we have our very first challenge help session. That is where any questions you have, please come and uh, join that session and ask um, what, you, or what we can help you with. We will have DocuSign experts who will walk you through pretty much any question that you have. Um, and if we can't answer it immediately, we will get that answer for you. Uh, but it, it is an extremely helpful session to join. Um, also, New, August 4th, we're doing a trivia night at 5 p.m. So make sure you sign up. There's a link there for a sign up now. You'll also get a notification. But trivia night top prize team will win a $750 Amazon gift card. Um, we have $1,500 worth of prizes uh, to be handed out. That is not in addition to some of the bonus prizes that we will be providing. It's a really fun night. The trivia is created by Geeks Who Drink, and it's guaranteed to be a good time. All right. With that, I want to say thank you very much to everyone for joining and especially thank you to Chase and Esri um, for going through such amazing tutorials for us once again. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks.